was fun. <laughs> Feels lonely up here. I want the whole cast back. <laughs> no, <kidding. laughs> so it's fun hanging out with them. People, you know, talk a lot about budgets of movies, and twenty-three thousand dollars gets thrown around a lot. But it's hard to ever talk about budgets because there's so much more to these films, both sweat equity and some money and some, you know, resources that you marshaled. So tell us a little bit about marshaling. Oh, the troops geez, and the resources geez. to get it made. Yeah, that 23, that was like what had actually been spent. Yeah. But there was so much. I think I still owed the lab a lot, all the sound work. Everyone had worked for a deferral. You know, I just look back at this and I'm like, oh, my God. Such an effort by, I mean, really the crew. Like, actors, it was sort of designed like, I think things were pretty slow back then. I was like, I bet we could get a day. A lot of actors could work a day or two. It, we weren't asking that much. But the crew, the main you know, seven to 11 people who were working, that was a much bigger ask. You know, Everybody really put their lives on hold and did just the movie that summer. You know, it was, and we didn't shoot every day, you know, it was, but it was, uh, wow, it was like a circus. You know, it was just, yeah, we'd be, shoot a couple days, then have a couple days off, but that would just be casting scenes that are coming up and rehearsing, and it was just a, it was about a two month this blur of energy and fun for sure. It was just incredible uh, what was going on right then. I think of it now, just like the energy in the town. It was, it was, it just, it was that vibe, you know. Seeing it on the big screen, there's so much elegance to this movie in, in both the way it's shot, but the construction yeah. of it. And that's something I think that gets taken for granted. People talk about slack or like this sort of messy, low budget identity. And, and in fact, it is. There's an incredible um, c calculation and elegance to oh how yeah. it's made. And so can you talk <laughs> a little bit about... I'm, I'm sitting next to Tommy, and he goes, is that all one shot? I'm going, yeah. I just, what was I thinking? Like, it was the arrogance of, the ignorance of lack of experience can really empower you <laughs> in a strange way. Like, these non-professional actors, starting with myself, to do these long monologues. Like, you would never do that. You know, you just, it doesn't make sense. You just wouldn't, there's nothing to cut to. There's, there's all these pitfalls for doing that. But it was just like, yeah, everybody can do it. Here's, you know, three minute scene, four minute scene. We'll just move the camera, we'll get it just right. You know, it's like, and we didn't have much film stock. I remember looking at this, it's like, oh yeah, that was the best take. But there was a couple ones before, it was just tough to pick. But in a way, the editing, it was like, pick the best take. It was so many of the scenes. But it, it had a, a, you know, kind of an interior flow that was sort of designed into it. But, but I forgot, you know, we, we did go back. It, the first cut was like two hours and it was lo long and in two different sections we had to go back and reshoot and connect, make a little connector scene to cut out a big ch chunk. If you heard actors before complaining <laughs> that they were cut out and they were in those, they were in those chunks. Yeah. But you had, you know, you had Dolly track, you had... Yeah. Yeah, the idea of a, of a no-budget film with just, you know, simple... F no, no, I didn't. It, I always conceived of this as just constant motion, and um, I'd done a film before this intentionally. The camera had never moved. It was just, like, compositions. And this, I, I thought, not only is everyone talking, but the camera's always moving. They ne hardly ever sit down. You know, I just had this kind of motion of both mind and... For a movie kind of about not much happening, I still wanted a certain momentum, but I remember Clark, Lee, you know, the whole crew, I said, all this motion, that's like, how, it's not all handheld, it's like, no, no, we want it to be very, much more eloquent, it's like, well, we need dolly track, and we need a dolly, and I think Clark and, and Lee, they were like, well, there's a dolly up at, like, UT, no one's using up in the TV station, it's like, oh, let's go borrow that, we can just borrow that for the summer, you know? It was an Elon Mac dolly that we just kind of got. You couldn't boom up like most dollies you can boom, but it, that, we weren't complaining. It was a, it was a dolly, a lot of dolly track. Scott Rhodes ended up like the dolly track master, <laughs> dolly track Scott. But uh, yeah, no, it was fun. Crane, had that crane shot, steady cam. That's what really made the film stand out. I think it's like, it was like, well, how'd you get that production value? Yeah. You know, you have a crane shot, steady cam. I'm like, yeah, we just got it. You know. <laughs> every favor and you know it was really Clark and Lee and uh, people who had worked on it kind of professionally in the industry you know whatever th that meant you know commercials and the occasional feature that was in town I'm thinking of the Austin film 
uh, professional community at that time, which I wasn't a part of at all. You know, I was the guy working at the hotel, writing, <laughs> you know, and making my own films. But uh, so for me, it was a big step up toward like professionalism. I'd never done a dolly shop before. I'd never done a lot of this stuff, but I was working with good people. It was, you know, you know what you want and make it happen. So, I mean, there were some things that were thrown together. You said you didn't have a sink in your house. I also heard the van was tricky that you guys were traveling <laughs> around. <laughs> that van was such an investment. It was like, I think I remember spending like $1,000 for a van because we have all this equipment. It's like, do we, we don't, it's like, we need a, we need a production vehicle. I'm like, oh gosh, $1,000. <laughs> but it wouldn't, um, I think it would only turn left. Does anyone remember? <laughs> there was something wrong with it. So you had to be very careful going to a location. If you made a mistake, you were just, <laughs> you had to go through neighborhoods to park it. You get one chance, you know. It was, <laughs> the whole, <laughs> that was very indicative of the movie. <laughs> it's funny remembering stuff like that, you know. It, it sounds charming now, but it was a total pain, you know. I see Jerry Deloney, you know, and I was like, Gosh, he would forget his T-shirt. You know, when you work with an actor more than one day, he was a couple days, and he'd be like, oh, hey, that T-shirt, I left it up. You know, so I'm driving him around town. I was just I'm like, oh, my God. It was just so much stuff to do around the making of the film that was just extra stuff. It was, I remember on my next film going, yeah, you can, you pay people, and they can go get the T-shirt. You don't have to do that. I was like, oh, yes, professionalism is good. And, you know, all volunteers so people can show up or not, you know. That's kind of where our title came from. We were all, um, we had a couple, like a working title, but, it, you know, we started calling each other uh, slackers. The word just kind of emerged from the slaves, like, ah, you're a slacker, slacker. Because, you know, people were like, okay, we're shooting at sunrise. Got, let's all be there at 5.30, and then, you know, we'll wander in around 6.30. So I'm like, yeah, you're not paying them. You can't really complain, but, you know, you're like... Yeah, so, it, yeah, everybody's calling each other slackers. So, uh, slacker, it just kind of came up. But I remember at our rap party, um, when we finished photography, it was, we had a little card. We had, like, six titles, and we had a vote. And slacker won by a little bit, but not by much. There were some others. It wasn't, it was kind of a weird title, in a way. I remember being, the first time we showed the movie, the USA Film Festival in Dallas, in May of ninety. Sam Arkoff, the great, uh, you know, producer AIP Pictures, was like, "Ah, kid, you got a film here?" I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "What's the name?" Slacker. Oh, bad title, bad title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, "Mars needs women." Now that's a title. <laughs> How to stuff a wild bikini? You know, films he had made. Yeah, yeah. Million dollar title. Million dollar title. Hundred thousand dollar movie. You know, like that. So yeah, it wasn't. People thought it sounded like slasher or something. I feel like it foreshadowed your really great titles for many <laughs> years to come on your movies. Titles are, they're, they're tough. No Longer Not Yet. No Longer Not Yet was another title for that the movie. That was one of six. <laughs> Feeling, that has an essence, but not that fun. Well, we saw just a fraction of the cast in the beginning um, who are here. Um, but I think, you know, drawing from the creative spirit that was Austin, but also the community is a huge part of this story. So I wanted you to talk about that process a little bit. And Austin Film Society was kind of key, knowing that the space and the resources yeah. of bringing people together at that time. I, again, you know, like the Film Society would really only exist in a town like Austin. You know, we, we came together right at the time Film Society's nationwide were going away. Going away. Mm -hmm. It happened in Austin. You know, a film like this, you couldn't really make it in other, uh, yeah, in one way you could, but you really couldn't. You know, like we paid for, I think, one location in this whole movie, the typewriter scene, where he's throwing it off. There was a guy who had a had a sh little business right parallel to that. I guess it was his lot. And I remember being really kind of, you know, like, oh man, twenty dollars. We can't. <laughs> we don't have twenty dollars. You know, but we just like extortion. It felt like extortion. That I was a little offended that here we would show up on his personal property and. <laughs> Park and make us be kind of pissed off that he, he was calling us on it. But uh, no, we just showed, you know, downtown, just set up dolly tracks on sidewalks, shoot. Every now and then someone would come by and just say, what are you doing? No city of it. Cops drove by all the time. The only time they stopped us was when we had the, at the end, you know, the amplified 
that part. They, they, pulled, they pulled us over. But then they said, okay, well, we're making a movie. <laughs> they were like, I think they're campaigning. You know, and then we got away with it. it wasn't, but everybody was cool. I don't know how else to say it. Everybody was cool. Um, in terms of people's individual stories, how much um, was part of the structure and how much was, were people crafting? Oh, yeah. I mean, every scene in this movie has its own origin story. But I think, to me, the, the most rewarding, like, fun part when I look back on it is just the collaboration. And it was something, I had been in acting classes for a long time. That's where all the long monologues, you do a lot of monologues in acting class. But I just had this theory, oh, anyone can be an actor, you know, like, and it's not true, not anyone, but of a certain type. And it was like t to work up each scene with the actors and to cast people who were, you felt perfect for the part. I remember I had this scene, this UFO guy, you know, we called him. And then um, Jerry Deloney comes in on an interview. I think Scott Rhodes had met him and just sent him in. Oh, check out this guy. It's a little weird. But he came in and he started saying, you know, he had some sightings. And, you know, he was, and I was like, oh, wow, you, you, you'd be good for that part. Sure enough, you know, so you just, every time someone would come in, you just start thinking who they could play in the movie. But it was very fluid, you know, I didn't have, it wasn't really rigid, it was, the structure was rigid, it was really tight in one way. It's almost like, I think the analogy might be the music was written, but the lyrics were in flux, you know, they could be, you know, pieced. And it really was just that marriage between who they were, their ideas, and what my ideas for the scene were, too. Some in, I usually I'd write the script like before the first rehearsal and then we'd sit down and do it. But some scenes were really more custom made to, to, the, to the actor. You know, I, I knew John Slate, the JFK guy. I'd known him for years. And, you know, he actually had a book called Conspiracy at Go-Go. He gave tours up there and said, hey, John, I got a part for you. You know, so <laughs> what are the best books? So we're just, we're working on the scene together. It's, it's fun to just, you're kind of editing someone else's ideas and energy and like thinking how it'll work as a scene. So Teresa Taylor, that crazy scene she described, she had told me that story a couple years before. The like, Dallas Highway. Yeah, shooting. the guy shooting. Yeah, she, she had told me that story. We were making t-shirts together for the Film Society one day and she told me that story. So like, whatever, three years later, I was like, hey, Teresa, you know that story you said? Let's work that. And then the I glommed the Madonna patch, you know, so it was on to that. And so everything had that kind of origin. You know, it's kind of a found object movie in some strange way. It's like stuff from everywhere. You know, I see a lot of quotes and a lot of, you know, stuff, notebooks full of ideas. And I don't know, it's, it, it's, it's a weird uh, kitchen sink construction of a lot of, a lot of stuff coming from, from all areas, you know. There's a, there's a bit of specificity about Austin, not so much that this movie didn't travel so well, you know, into other college towns and people recognized it, but there are, there are right. moments that are so very specifically Austin. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering how that reads to you <laughs> now, uh, 30 years on, and, and you know, this is, it is an experience uh, I mean, for us all watching it, you know, trying to I identify mean, the street corner. I haven't seen this film lately. Yeah. <laughs> so it was interesting to watch it and to feel you know, how we were all watching it together. Isn't it great to be back in a movie theater? By the way? Just, it's so, people, like, this is what we live for. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> but I, I realized laughs had changed positions. Like, uh, Lewis Mackey, the old anarchist, like, the Whitman got the big laugh and the, the Texas legislator, legislature yeah. got, like, a chuckle, but now those had kind of switched. <laughs> like, legislature got a huge laugh, very right now, today, that, and, uh, <laughs> and Whitman is darker, you know, it's like, ooh, that's, is that that funny? At the time, I thought, oh, it had been a long time, come on, tragedy plus time, right? So, uh, but yeah, I see it darker, I, a lot of this stuff, it's like, guys, I, I wouldn't have done this if I was a, a dad who <laughs> cared about the future, you know? <laughs> It ages so well in so many ways, but those those specific uh, moments. I, I mean, do you Dark. do you find like I mean I, I think you know we, the reason we all love it here and why Austin continues to be so special is because there is um, still the creativity underneath everything and here with us and so many um, people who who remain to keep 
to keep that alive, but I think it was you know underneath every every piece of slacker. Well, it's uh, it's been there in Austin, and I think this just is a it's a document of a time and place, but it's kind of the spirit of the uh, the city. You know, I mean, we were we were out of date when we did this. You know, it was kind of like oh, you missed you know that thing in Austin. The song Ed Hall sings at the end, Cedric. If you know that song, it's like it's that Austin thing about read the lyrics to that song. It's like you just missed it. You know, right. all these right. clubs close. You know, like yeah. it's talking about the old Austin and how, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that way. But uh, yeah, we were very aware of the, the, what had gone on in the 60s and the 70s. We felt like we were didn't have much to comment on, you know, like it, that had been done. So we were sort of commenting on that, just the notion of what is your time. So looking back at kind of, oh, that is kind of, film's powerful, you know, it is a document of a time and a place. I was thinking before tonight, you know, wondering for you whether this movie represents artistic freedom for you, um, given um, how it was made and with your community and how much you, you know, you didn't have to prove anything to anyone, but also the level of constraint is, is so extreme on low-budget films. So what, what, what yeah, do you think both. about that? Yeah, you're certainly not reined in creatively, but it's so, it's difficult. It's a... It, every day is such a challenge. It, it was, yeah. I don't know if I'm not really answering your question, but th that wasn't in doubt. The the freedom part. It was yeah. It was just expressing yourself and making the film you want to make. But you know, it, it was a good template for me <laughs> moving yeah. forward. It's yeah. like no, oh, that's how you should feel making a movie. You know, there shouldn't be interference or any. You know, just there's something singular about what you're trying to do. That's good. But the constraints are just the world, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Trying to m put something together is it's just like some days it's it's all, you know. It's just sometimes difficult. Watching it again, I'm like, especially in contrast to this summer, that was like the hottest summer ever. <laughs> it was like 100 degrees every day. At least we had consistent sun, you know, partly cloudy, but it was we di we didn't lose any days for rain. Put it like that. It was very hot. So you, the structure is based on, I mean, I think there's other other films that have this handoff, like La Jean um, and Max of Fools La Ronde, and so they, so, w and those films obviously have bigger support <laughs> and budgets and people and professionals. How, did, kind of, what made you think, I mean, not, you know, you're audacious creatively, but what made you think, like, this could work or this is the right format? It was just an early idea I had. I remember I was driving to Houston late at night, and I, I was like, yeah, 23, first year in Austin. I was just in love with cinema and thinking about movies. And I was like, well, why couldn't you make a movie that went one character? And th you know, like, uh, had I ever seen that? And at that time, I hadn't seen that movie. So in my mind, like most things, that you think you have an original idea. And you do have your own idea. But then over the years, I'd see a film. It's like, oh, Boonwell and Phantom of Paradise kind of does that. Not in a baton pass kind of way that we did. He would just cut, and it'd be like, that's like super radical, you know? But, uh, and LaRonde is so obvious about it. Because I was telling my dad about my idea. Like, I wanted to do this. And he goes, have you ever seen LaRonde? And I'm like, no. He goes, yeah, that, yeah, all these things. You know, love stories. So, you know, dads have a good way of saying, you're not that creative. <laughs> it's all been done before. I said, well, we're going to do a little different, you know? I, uh, so, anyway, it wasn't. This originality wasn't even in the air. It wasn't, it was just, you know, what was, did it feel real, you know, to what we were trying to do? Should we take one or two questions before we wrap it up? Anybody All right. have a really if anybody wants to stand up and ask a really good one, we're going to take it. Yes, right here. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great one. It, it was, that was not, that was the kind of the, end of the era for the IBM Selectric. I think we bought two of them for like $20 <laughs> that weren't working, but they still look pretty good. But uh, yeah, and that, that's a complete lie when he throws it off and you hear a splash of water. There was no water anywhere near that. We, that's a, <laughs> it was bone dry down there. <laughs> it's funny what you remember. Maybe one more. Yep, 
Great. Sure. Hold on, hold on. We got one over here. Yep, go ahead. Yep. Themes of, yeah, the, the sort of violence or allusion to guns and, the, and shooting and, um, yeah, lots of that, that emerging, sort of the dark yeah, side. I was thinking a lot about, like, secondary sources. You know, like, nothing really happens in the movie, but they're all obsessed with pretty extreme ideas. And even the guy with the backpack, you know, talking about obsessed with violence. And he talked about the one time he had seen it. I was just kind of at that time thinking a lot about how little we actually experience in the world that it's all from secondary sources like your relation with with wild animals you know it's all from you know neutral of Omaha wild kingdom you haven't been on a safari you don't know anything and same with violence have you ever seen someone really shot and killed no you've seen it in movies and tv you know so it's like well what is our perception of the world so i, I remember kind of thinking like that and just thinking how in that void of nothing happening that you do kind of think extreme, you know, you, you do kind of romanticize or, or you know, um, I don't know. But, you know, it's a little, a little crazy. The film is, this has got a really dark, you know, morbidity. There's a lot of mortality and stuff, but there's not, you know, the guy running over his mom, that was like a local story. Our, the house we lived in, the finger hut there at the beginning, we paid our rent to some trust and the rumor was, a guy had run over his mother, and it was like the family trust, and he's in some insane asylum. I don't know if that's true, but it, it was our truth that was, you know. <laughs> so I was just kind of telling the story of our house, you know, the people we paid our rent to. Well, the theme of constructing your own reality is so consistent <laughs> in the film, too, yeah. and I think that's another, another reason why there's so much coherency to it. And, and um, yeah, I think there were a few themes just going through, and they weren't, like, written out necessarily. It was just a, you know, as a director, you're saying yes and no to, to ideas and thoughts, and it was like, does it fit in the movie or doesn't it? So you're just sort of a taste, you know, yes-no machine constantly. So. All right, we had last one in the balcony. Somebody said, hey, Rick, who was that? Yeah. Okay, back here, yes. You'll talk to him later. That sounds vaguely threatening. <laughs> we sent you a check, right? Yeah, go here. <laughs> if not, just give your address. We have. Go ahead. No, it's OK. OK. All right, cool. All right, so. Still, that's vaguely threatening. No, yeah. I'm <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I think we should go party, but um, would love your yes. parting words on Slacker at 30 before we 30. go. Well, wow. We'll see you guys at the 40? <laughs> what was it? That's a thing. Um, no, it's just so cool to, to, uh, to be here, you know, watching a movie with, with a lot of, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty surreal, I think, for a lot of us who worked on it. It's, it's fun, though, but it's, you know, something you don't think about a lot, and then, boom. You know, you make a film, and it exists. And you got to deal with it <laughs> the rest of your life. <laughs> anyway, is that it? Thank you, guys. Big round of applause. See you for at the, the movies. Crew. See you Thursday at AFS. Paramount, AFS, great theaters. So. <laughs>